Hi, I'm Mark. If you're just tuning in, good morning. Uh, we have a chat uh, over which way? This way or that way? Uh, feel free to say hi, good morning. Let me know what time is it at your place. Uh, I'm in the Netherlands. It's now 3.30. Uh, in the afternoon, uh, and I'm super excited to host this coming block uh, for you. For the next two hours, you'll be uh, joined by me and the guests uh, in um, in this uh, block. So let's see how many people have found the chat. Uh, Birgit is there. Uh, good to see you're in there, Birgit. Uh, again, if you're just waking up, welcome, welcome to the conference. There is still a lot more uh, going on. Uh, we've uh, started. Uh, a few hours ago, had seen a lot of good talks. Uh, yeah, Baltimore, cool. Now, Jamin is helping six and a half, six and a half hours in. Then from Phoenix in the morning. Uh, hi, Dan. Savannah. Yeah, the U.S. is uh, is waking up uh, slowly but surely. Um, so, uh, like I said, I'm Mark uh, from the Service Design Show. You might have seen my face or heard my voice uh, if you listen to the Service Design Show. Raise your hand. Uh, it's nice to know that people are uh, tuning in to that. Um, yeah. So I guess um, now it's time for <laughs> the big unveiling. I'm really uh, honored and uh, excited to announce the first keynote of this uh, conference. Uh, the first keynote is going to be Dory Turnstall. And when I asked Dory about her first memory of service design, she uh, she came back with a story which is quite interesting. When she was eight and went to her McDonald's and noticed that they actually pay a lot of attention to how quickly the service was delivered. That was sort of the first moment she got thinking about uh, designing service. Um, Dory is the Dean of Faculty of Design at the Ontario College of Art and Design University, OCAT University. Uh, she's the first black and black female dean of a faculty of design and um, there she leads a lot of culture-based innovation initiatives focused on the on using old ways of knowing to drive innovation processes that directly benefit communities. Um, in the past, Dory served as an associate professor of design anthropology and associate dean at Swiss Swinburne University in Australia. She taught at the University of Illinois in Chicago and she organized the US National Design Policy Initiative. Um, I'm really looking forward to the talk. Dory is going to address the ways in which design has been disrespectful to indigenous, black uh, and people of color communities. And uh, there she'll draw upon her recent experiences uh, at the Oakett University, moving towards decolonization of its curriculum, governance, and hiring practices. Uh, if you have questions for Dory, please uh, keep them for the Q&A. We'll do a Q&A after the talk right away. Uh, you can share them in Slido, which is the right side panel of the live stream. So uh, yeah, I guess without further ado, have, do a very big round of virtual applause uh, in the chat. And let's welcome Dory Tunsell to the stage. Uh, good morning, good evening, good night, everyone <laughs> around the world. Uh, so let me begin with um, land acknowledgement. So I acknowledge the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron Wendat to the traditional owners and custodians upon the lands on which I am gathered. Um, we do a land acknowledgement uh, as an important part of thinking about decolonization and particularly um, understanding whose lands we are on, what our relationships to the land and what our relationships are to the peoples of the land and all of the other living things that are a part of the land. Um, uh, as Mark introduced, I'm from OCAD University. OCAD University is the uh, oldest and largest uh, art and design institution in Canada. Um, it's the third largest art and design institution in North America. Um, again, as he introduced, I'm the first black and black female dean of a faculty design anywhere. I'm a design anthropologist and my background is African American. Um, these are important because it uh, helps frame 
my interest and focus on um, sort of decolonizing design. And what I'll walk through is kind of six, six steps for embracing change um, in institutions and organizations as we create a space in which um, diverse peoples feel that they have a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose in the field of design. Uh, so again, I'm a design anthropology, so anthropologist, so I'm really interested in human values. And one of the key values that's been important um, at OCAG University is respect. Um, and we have an ethos of respect for design. And that respect is important because again, I'm interested in the relationship between values, design, and people's experiences. That's what it defines being a design anthropologist for me. And so figuring out what the values are around the practices that we're doing is, is key to um, helping to set the context for why design needs to change. Um, I'm gonna introduce uh, the concept or the ethos of respectful design through you through my uh, beautiful uh, faculty. At OCAD University Faculty Design, we practice what we call respectful design. Respectful design, what does it mean to the Faculty of Design? It means valuing inclusivity and people's cultures and ways of knowing through empathetic and responsible creative methodologies. It means deepening our relationships, the lives of materials and the cross of making. The challenge facing design today is really to reestablish the relationship with nature. In other words, to design ourselves back into the environment. For example, adding the indigenous concept of seven generations to inform sustainable design. <laughs> Good design takes a certain amount of humility. We have to recognize that we can do harm as well as good. It's about need over want. Respectful design means acknowledging different values, different manners of production, and different ways of knowing. The widest possible range of diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, and beyond. Designing futures with inclusion and belonging for everyone. Come join us here at OCAD University's Faculty Design and find out what respectful design means to you. At OCAD University. <laughs> um, so respectful design or articulating the notion of respectful design has been really important because design has been actually quite disrespectful to Black, Indigenous, and POC communities in the land in, in itself. Um, this is made manifest by the fact that um, my Black, Indigenous, and POC students often feel like they have to choose between their beautiful nuanced identities and being a professional designer. Um, and that is connected to the fact that in many ways the values of design have been and still are in some ways collected, uh, connected to colonialism, uh, notions of white supremacy, patriarchal um, structures, as well as capitalism. And then for many of these, my students, again, these, these structures, the way in which design values have been structures have been really quite harmful um, and thus deeply impactful in how their ability to embrace design as a field. And I'll sort of make a big statement like that. You have to sort of ground it in something. So I'm gonna ground it into uh, a kind of an understanding of, of sort of the context in which design exists in North America. Um, so places like Canada and the United States are defined as settler colonial states. And that means that um, there are kind of three positionalities in relationship to the state. Um, this is quite well articulated by Eve Tuck and W.K. Yang in an amazing seminal um, uh, article called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. Um, and what they sort of define is that there's three kind of positionalities. Uh, there is the indigenous position, um, positionality, there's a settler positionality, and then there's a slave positionality. And the relationships to the land in a settler colonial state is that the land has been stolen um, and that the policies of the land uh, often um, are assimilationist um, in terms of uh, setting up policies that are cultural, if not physical, um, genocide against those who are non-European um, settlers into the state. Um, 
so this then affects again different relationships. So um, when the Black and BIPOC, it means that they've been brought involuntarily to the land in North America. That um, in terms of like assimilationist policies, they are completely unassimilatable by the state. Um, because regardless of the fact that, um, let's say as an African-American, my name is Elizabeth Tunstall. English, English is my first language. Many of the sort of cultural practices come from sort of a European heritage that the structure of the uh, state in and of itself, which is being quite expressed right now around the Black Lives Matter meeting, um, movement means that um, the notion of the state in and of itself cannot accept a Black identity as being a centered identity in another state. And then this makes itself manifest in, again, the role of design. One of the things that I always talk about um, to my students is that um, the invention of the cotton gin, um, that um, the cotton gin was one of those um, inventions that really changed the fabric of the United States, but also around the world and the way in which sort of um, slavery was connected as a global um, force. Uh, Eli Whitley in uh, 1793 um, invented the cotton gin and its main purpose was to remove the seeds from cotton so that then the cotton can be spun and all the sort of products sort of created. This was a laborious process that would take days and days and days for slave labor, enslaved labor to be able to do. So basically the invention reduced a, a, a task that would take days to a task that would actually take hours. The result of that though, um, the efficiency gain in this invention by design led to greater enslavement. So in 1790, there was about um, 700,000 slaves in the United States due to, and, and slavery was actually waning. Um, by the time of 1850, the abolition of slavery, there was 3.2 million slaves in the United States. And this was by design. Like when you read the diaries of Eli Whitley, he knew that it was going to increase enslaved production. He knew by design that this invention uh, was, was to create more wealth through slavery. And so this is a way in which, again, design is then implicated in these structures of slavery, um, which by design, again, le led to almost a five times fold increase in slavery in the 1700s. Um, again, in terms of indigenous communities, their relationship to the land, that they are the original custodians. Um, and then the, their relationship to assimilationist policies is that they have actively had to fight against assimilationist policies for 500 years. In the context, again, of North America, the way in which this has uh, most harmfully made itself manifest was in the series of boarding schools that were established in which indigenous youth um, were taken away from their families and their communities, put in boarding schools, uh, re uh, forbidden to speak their language, forbidden to wear their traditional dresses, um, forbidden to uh, do their traditional practices in order to be, again, direct quote, to um, have the Indian um, um, brought, um, removed from them, right? Um, this then makes manifest in all of the debates that we have around the appropriation and misappropriation of indigenous um, motifs in design. So in 2015, this British fashion label K2Z um, stole a sacred design by a Canadian Induit shaman named Owa. Um, now, this was only possible when you have the attitude that indigenous people are no longer existing, that you do not have any obligation to negotiate, to partner with or collaborate because you don't feel that they actually exist. And so the harm that is done in all of these debates around indigenous appropriation and misappropriation has to do with the harm in two ways. One, uh, that is based on a premise of entitlement in which it is not felt that you need to ask permission or to negotiate the use of, of their cultural heritage. Um, it's harmful in a more deeper sense is that most of the times that 
the motifs that are being taken are sacred. And so in an indigenous system in which those motifs are technologies by which you control and engage with the universe, the misuse of those symbols, the misuse of those motifs is actually negatively affecting um, the entire balance of the universe. And so again, in the context design has been harmful and continues to be harmful because we have this debate about the misappropriation of indigenous um, artifacts and heritage every season, fashion season, it seems, um, that this is only premised on the fact that um, people feel entitled to take through this colonial structure that which they feel exists without ownership, right, of, of indigenous peoples. And then lastly, um, in terms of sort of, and POC in this sense refers to um, anyone else who is non-European um, uh, and non-white. So this is Asian, South Asian, uh, Latinx, uh, Filipina, Pacifica, all from people from different places around the world who have normally had to escape their home to become new settlers to the land. Um, and then the, in terms of their relationship to assimilationist policies, that be, depending on their class, depending on where they fit in terms of their skin color, depending on their education, they will have some privileges to be able to choose which aspects of their heritage that they're willing or able or forced to in some ways give up in order to be able to assimilate into the state. Um, and again, this image is of uh, a, an advertisement for soap powder, but is also used um, to, uh, to basically endorse the Chinese Exclusion Act, which in the United States took place in 1882 and in Canada, 1885. So again, you see the advertising industry um, deeply implicated in, again, harmful policies um, towards uh, Chinese people. Um, who again built the railroads of both the United States as well as Canada. And so actually the Chinese Exclusion Acts normally came into effect after the building of these railroads. Um, so this is just to sort of say that understanding that in the context of the least North America, as our students encounter the experience of design, they also encounter the experience of the way in which design has been harmful to their identities and harmful to their communities. And that's to talk about decolonization is again, remembering that it is about indigenous land sovereignty, but it also requires that we liberate design from what we call, or I call, or we call it OCAD, the modernist project. And what that really um, means is that, that at a specific time in a specific place in Europe, <laughs> Uh, there was this notion that progress could be achieved um, through technology in order to bring luxury to the masses. And that in Europe, uh, you know, we need to let go of our national identities, which have brought us into conflict for thousands and thousands of years, um, so that we can be part of a universal mankind. Um, again, this is then reflected in modernist designs um, in which you get rid of, let's say, you know, German black, um, black, um, <laughs> black paste, I don't know, that's not what it's called. Um, get rid of sort of uh, the culture patrimony, I guess, of different, let's say, typefaces, or you get rid of the sort of um, motifs in particular designs that are indicators of a particular nation, of a particular culture, in order to become one. But this then comes in the context of being exported from Europe to other places becomes, again, the project of uh, colonization 2.0, where the way in which you lower the prices of uh, that which you have made to make it affordable to the masses is through the, um, the taking of indigenous land so that the land is cheap and free, and then the taking of um, of Black, Asian, other forms of labor, um, poorly paid or not paid at all, so that the production of, of those materials are cheap and thus affordable to not all the masses, but actually a very specific mass. 
And then the project of getting rid of your national baggage in order to become part of universal um, hem humankind becomes the, the, the basis of a sort of cultural genocide in which again, many indigenous black and POC communities are required to, are forced to not speak their languages, not speak their cultural practices, not practice their designs, not practice their, um, their language, religion, all of those things that make their lives meaningful. So, <laughs> I'm gonna pause here for a second, just to give you an opportunity to sort of think about a little bit that, again, this is a global off, um, global community, but I would say in many places, there is that same sort of triangulation of relationships where you have an original set of people. Um, you have a group of people who have been brought in um, as um, in many ways enslaved, whether that's indentured servitude, um, or through slavery. And then you have a group of people of who've settled, right? Who've settled to build their good life on the land. And in some cases, in many cases, the labor of other people. So just kind of pause a bit of a moment for you to kind of think about, you can kind of put it maybe in the chat of in the places where you are, what are the, what's the way in which that triangulation of relationships and positionalities might work? Who are considered the original people? Who are considered those who may have settled much later? Who are those that have been brought in, again, in terms of an economic exploitative class um, by which others have been able to build a good life? And so just pause here a little bit to get you the opportunity to sort of think about that before I move into um, the change part <laughs> of the conversation. So then let's talk about change. Um, the picture that I've painted of design is not a very good picture. Um, it's a picture of, again, the way in which design has been quite harmful. Um, but I paint this picture not to make people feel guilty or for people to feel um, um, sad, uh, but to set, to set the conditions in which to understand change is possible and what is required in order for change to happen. Um, at OCAD University, we've just uh, in some ways celebrated our black cluster hire in which we addressed 144 years of zero representation of black faculty members in design um, um, for the first time. And we hired five of them bringing sort of critical mass. And so out of this experience, we've been sort of quite reflective on what we've been doing the last few years in terms of bringing diversity, equity, and decolonization to design. And we've kind of summarized it into six steps. Um, the first step is putting indigenous demands first. Um, this, um, before we did the black cluster hire, we actually had an indigenous cluster hire. Um, and, and this is set the template for a lot of the changes that we set in terms of bringing in five new tenure and tenure track faculty member who identified as indigenous peoples of North America or Turtle Island. Um, it was part of our academic plan, which was about uh, decolonization, diversity and equity. Um, we were able to do so in, as part of a Ontario Human Rights Code to address underrepresentation, and um, and it's been transformational in the sense that we now are building critical mass to change our curriculum. So the picture of the buffalo is the work of um, Howard Monroe, who was in the video speaking in uh, Métis, which is the language of the Métis. He's Red River Métis. And he's taking the seven grandfather teachings um, of mostly the Anishinaabe and applying that to redefine the design process so that the research and analysis process in design is now the respect process in design. Um, it's creating space for indigenous students to feel that they can belong. Um, and then they have faculty members who can guide them through the process of understanding what decolonization might mean for them and to mean for their um, curriculum. Um, 
Owning up, number two is owning up to the institution's racism and white supremacy. Um, so at our institution, we had a presidential task force on underrepresentation. We had meetings, uh, it was built into sort of a report. We gathered the data. Uh, we had workshops on understanding whiteness without white supremacy so that we could understand the ways in which our practices and design was, con was causing harm especially to our Black, Indigenous, and POC students. Um, and understanding that white supremacy is not just embodied in people, but is actually a culture. And so drawing on the uh, research of Tima Okun, really understanding what alternative values that we can put into practice in the institution so that we are not practicing um, white supremacy. Um, establishing authentic relationships to um, Black, Indigenous, and POC communities. Like this was really important, especially for the Black cluster hire. Um, this is me attending almost every community event that I could physically get to <laughs> um, in the four years that I had been at OCAD University. Um, when I arrived, that different faculty members had a deep relationship to community, but not the institution in and of itself. And so it meant me going to many different events representing not me as an individual, but representing OCAD as an institution, giving support in terms of financial support for events, giving support in terms of allowing community to use our spaces and interact with our spaces. But again, building authentic relationship with the community the fourth is then make a call for applications that are related to community interest and not just your own interests. This is probably one of the things I will be most proud of, which is the writing of this position description for our Black Cluster hire. And it was a thing where um, what we did that was really important is put first and forward the importance of the lived experiences of the Black candidates that we were seeing. Um, and then spoke to not needing a service designer or an interaction designer, but to topics that was of interest to the community in and of itself. So Black speculative futures, multi-sensory storytelling as it relates to representations of Black lives, hip hop aesthetics. And so um, one of the things that make me really quite happy is that many of the candidates said that they went through the process just ticking off. Yes, I'm into Black speculative futures, yes, I'm into representations of black light. Yes, I'm into hip hop aesthetics. So that they cried when they read the position description because it was the first time that they felt an institution had called on their holistic sense of self as being of value to the institution itself, not just what skills that they could bring. And then we looked at standards that take into account systemic exclusion. Um, one of those things that we, again, don't think about is that we have in our head a persona of our ideal person that we want to bring into an institution. So in our case, it's a traditional academic, has a master's degree, maybe a PhD, one or two years in post-secondary, um, a record of research through grants, conferences, et cetera, et cetera. But again, for many communities, because of relationships to colonialism and enslavement and they haven't had the opportunity to make access to those traditional academic institutions. So really the change you're trying to bring out is to open things out. So we opened up into two different personas, a Praxis star who again had limited access or exclusion for post-secondary institutions, but had done tremendous amount of work that could demonstrate the transmission of knowledge from one generation to another through their uh, workshops that they may have given. Um, that could demonstrate like a record of professional practice through like commissions that they received or grants, um, not grants, but um, contracts that receive um, from projects for clients. And then a community connector who again may have experiences of exclusion from post-secondary institutions, but have had again, teaching experience in terms of even a religious role of teaching Sunday school or have had a um, record of community practice where they've set up community meetings and workshops or self-published reports 
all those skills that we look for in the traditional academic, but take a different form of expression because they've been excluded from post-secondary institutions. And then lastly, hiring in for critical mass. So I always say hire in three. So this is the black faculty of OCAD University as of June 3rd, 2020. Um, we're from all over different places in the world, different ages, different heritage, different backgrounds, um, but be able to assemble for the first time, like our black cluster hire doubled the number of black faculty that we have has been transformational. And it's transformational because of three things. We now, in our institution, we have three levels. We have a black representation in, at the entry level, which is our students. We have black representation in the middle level of influencers, which is our faculty. And you have me as a sort of um, black representation in leadership with real power and influence. Like I can say no to something and it not happen. And that's really important when you're thinking about your diversity and inclusion initiatives and changing the institution is making sure that you have critical mass in all three levels of the institution because you want to know if the institution is giving diverse people's power in the leadership. Is it giving influence in the middle? Is it giving growth for those who are at the entry level? And you only can see holistically whether your institution or not is diverse, inclusive, and decolonizing if you have enough representation of diverse individuals in those roles. And so our six steps were putting Indigenous demands first, owning up to the institutional racism and white supremacy, establishing authentic relationships to community, making the call about the community interest, not just our institutional interests, understanding how systemic exclusion work. And so rewriting our qualifications to take that into account and then hiring for critical mass because you never know until in the way in which people can belong at an institution until there's critical mass that they can see themselves reflected at all levels of the institution. And that is it in terms of my presentation. I'm happy to take sort of questions. Stop sharing. Thank you, Doria. I think there will be a lot of uh, questions. By the way, there are uh, over 700 people watching uh, your talk. So uh, that's a new record for today. Uh, because <laughs> Canada and uh, the US are waking up and tuning in uh, to, your, to your talk. So that's awesome. Um, before I get into the Q&A from the audience, I have some questions. Uh, Question, uh, questions yeah. myself. There was one thing you mentioned that you were most proud of, which was the job position. I'm also curious if you could pick one thing, what do you find was the most challenging or difficult thing in this process? Um, <laughs> I think the most challenging, the challenging aspect of this process is making the institution comfortable with the level of change that this was going to bring. Um, many conversations was held with the faculty members, many conversations was held with the faculty association in terms of the union, uh, conversations were um, through HR, uh, and then again with the provost, president, like to make this kind of change happen, you have to be able to convince every single institution or body, um, body within the institution that this change is going to be good that this change is going to lead the institution to um, a place where um, a place where its values will be apparent and other people will recognize um, and reward <laughs> in some ways um, this shift in values. Um, and so what's been really fortunate, right, is that, you know, that that has happened. Um, that, that the institution feels that by making, taking this very risky um, step in many ways, that it's raised its profile internationally, uh, that um, more students and more diverse students are coming, uh, more support in terms of funding and fundraising is happening. And so in that sense that, um, but it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work to be able to convince, conv to give them a vision 
of the change that would um, that would address the fact that most institutions are quite risk averse. So. And and it, was there something in that process that you feel um, gave them the confidence? Uh, you said it was a lot of conversations. It was giving them a vision of the future. Uh, uh, was it really incremental or were there moments that you now can look back and say, well, I, that pivoted the conversation? Um, I would say overall it was incremental, but sometimes there are things that pivot really quickly. So it was like, so let's say take the job description. So coming to the job description was like incremental changes over a period of four years where the first year, um, we didn't use the language and we had some success with our searches, but not, not getting the candidates that we really wanted. Uh, the second year we started introducing the language of lived experience, right? So saying we're looking for a, you know, a textile designer whose work is connected to their lived experience of, of, of indigenous and racialized communities. And that we, I actually had a beta test because I didn't use it in some of the other searches. And we, the results of like the kind of candidates that we got and the kind of conversations we had were quite different for that particular search where we used that language. So then, then in the next year in that search, we used that language in all of the calls and the, our entire process of interviewing transformed completely. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, to the extent to which sometimes it's challenging to get my faculty to want to be on job searches, but because people were telling 360 degree stories of their lives that like my faculty were really interested, like they wanted to know these people. And so, and then again, the fact that as candidates, they brought their full selves into the conversations that they then felt when we embraced them as a candidate that we were really embracing them. So all of these things that were sort of incremental and in changing the language, but then, like I said, you have these watershed moments where the call for the black cluster hire went viral. Like I mean, <laughs> in the sense that, and then the example of that is like one of my former students said that within the hour of releasing, five separate people sent him the job description saying you should apply for this, right? Mm, mm. And that, and again, this is the thing as it's, it's, we're designers. So we like, we design communications that reach into our audiences. We design personas that kind of give us a sense of what it is. And all that I did in this process is take all of the tools that we use in design and apply it to ourselves. <laughs> That's often the hardest thing, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Let's, uh, it's good that we have uh, a lot of time left for Q and A. Uh, so let's jump into some questions um, from the audience, and uh, I'm going to have to pick uh, a few. So um, uh, here's a question uh, to you: Do you have examples of design decolon decolonization phenomena happening around happening around the world? Yeah. Next to the examples that you gave, gave already. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I, I mean, the, the thing is that normally the fall season is my travel season, so I'm traveling to, and it like, so this year is the first year I've been grounded um, and not being able to travel because of the COVID-19, but let's say uh, this time last year I was in Chile um, and Colombia. Um, actually, I was in Chile during the uprising there. Um, in uh, Colombia, there was this, a really amazing um, project, um, and I'm going to have to like, type into the thing, the sort of name um, of it, where um, the, um, uh, the Art and Design Institution, um, the uh, Universidad de las Artes, uh, was um, working with um, sort of indigenous communities in the mountains, um, Montaña de Maria, now it's all coming back, uh, working in partnership with them to uh, to, in many ways, help them with the branding and the strategy around how to um, how to revitalize the land. Because again, in, in Colombia, there's been years and years of like conflict and civil war. And so now that the civil war was ending, the, um, the university was partnering to, again, replant a biodiverse um, um, 
ecosystems, and then working with partnerships with 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 um, um, industry partners like um, um, crepes and waffles, uh, which is a sort of business there to um, again, revitalize indigenous communities. So they help them with some of the packaging, they help them with the strategy, they help with actually the research and the mapping around what are the kinds of water use that needs to be done and what are the, what are the traditional practices that can be reintroduced into the community. Um, again, old ways of knowing <laughs> from my sort of background that then can lead to sort of innovative processes. So that's an example of like the work that's been done um, in Colombia. Um, again, there's a couple years ago, there is wonderful project that was being done um, actually in the Netherlands, Mark, hmm. um, where um, I think it was the uh, University of Antwerp where the students were given the assignment in some ways to kind of to look at the relationship between sort of Dutch and colonization around the world and the kind of products, right, that sort of entered into sort of the Dutch um, uh, cultural life, right, that is actually based on sort of products that are from Indonesia, or products from all over the world. So again, and then thinking about unpacking those relationships um, that are behind those products, how it relates to the branding. So whether or not sort of like the colonial project was embedded in the branding. So there's a lot of work that is actually going on all around the world that is really um, focused on this. I'm really, right now, I'm, I'm excited about the work that's happening at California College of the Art and their decolonial school, where they are, uh, they've went through this, they're, I guess, in the second year of the project where they're rewriting their curriculum from these decolonial principles um, in such a way that it's not just, it's like the whole design and art school, right? Are in this process of, again, decolonization is again, recognizing in some ways the, the, that our values of design come from a time and a place and most of the time Europe in the 1800s. Um, and that's what our notion of design, although there's been about 65,000 65, years of design, if you're coming from the Australian um, Aboriginal perspective. So, so some of it's unpacking that, right? Unpacking the fact that our notion of design is not neutral and universal, but it's cultural and specific. And then the second part of that is opening up other spaces for other histories of design to enter into the design academy enter into design business in and of itself so that everyone is able to see themselves reflected in design. So that, like I said, my young designers don't feel like they have to choose between a professional designer, being a professional designer and maintaining their cultural identities. I know that the I'm going to pitch for another conference, uh, the Surfdesk conference, uh, 2020 is going to be 2021 now. Um, the topic of decolonization is going to be a big topic over there. And uh, episode 101 of the Service Design Show is also related to this topic. So if people want to dig deeper into that, those would be also two good resources. Um, there are so so <clears throat> many good questions that I want to um, uh, address with you. I can imagine that you get this question uh, quite often. Um, where to start as a designer to translate all these steps into the quote unquote real world, especially in a big corporation? Mm -hmm. Well, any, these are any the tips, these, advice on that. Yeah. I mean, this is these are the conversations that I'm having. Like in the last two months, I've had so many conversations with large corporations. Um, they, and I would say they're, they're starting in different places. I think a, a lot of them are starting in what for us is step two, which is actually mm. just owning up to the way, the, the racism that are built into the structures of the institution and the way in which there's that the guiding principles or, or values of the institution are wrapped around sort of a white supremacist culture, right, as a culture. And so many of them are actually uh, doing their surveys to figure out where, you know, the baseline surveys to figure out where they have underrepresentation. Um, many of them are figuring out, um, are changing again, um, their hiring processes. So again, I've been sharing a lot of the things that I've said, which again, especially for design 
uh, companies, I'm like, it's just building out different personas. <laughs> you know how to do that, right? It's again, rethinking the way in which your language is exclusive. You talk about inclusive design all the time in your, in your business. This is putting it into practice into your institution in and of itself. But I would say the first step most of them are taking was to get a baseline of understanding what in their culture is, is exclusionary in and of itself and then where they have real underrepresentation. Uh, and then I would sort of say what they should be doing, but many of them are not, is like, again, um, indigenous first. Uh, that would be the thing that really building relationships with whoever is your indigenous communities in the place that you are, figuring out how you bring their knowledge and lived experiences into the institution. If you are able to build the relationships of trust so that you and quote unquote establish a pipeline in which in your, again, local indigenous people feel a sense of belonging, feel a sense of inclusion, feel a sense of being able to make a contribution to the institution, then you will have solved many of the problems of decolonization through the relationship building and the dismantling that you have to do of your systems to make that happen, right? Have you seen um, at which place in an organization does this have the most um, chance of success? Mm -hmm. who, who is the most open to have this conversation and cr create this awareness and, and open this Pandora's box? Um, I would say, I mean, in many ways is the, the CEOs are, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but, they don't, but they're yeah. the ones who doesn't have to implement it. <laughs> um, I mean, um, leadership tends to be very supportive. I think that the challenge that people have is again, understanding what that change means. Like even, um, HR functions, I would say in the conversations I have, a lot of this has was, was been put on HR function. Um, so people who are closely related to HR roles. I would say in the, in the work that we've done at OCAD, we have an Office for Diversity, Inclusion and Sustainability Initiatives, which is sort of um, an independent um, sort of ombudsman um, for the institution. So a lot of that work, so there's like diversity and inclusion sort of officers that are being positions that are being created. So that is where it's um, residing as well. I say the lever of change, um, I would say for, for us is that that relationship between those who have the knowledge about diversity and inclusion um, and HR, because the change you're actually trying to make is the change in the makeup of the institution in and of itself, right? So, um, so changing your practices um, of exclusion so that you can bring those perspectives into the institution and that those individuals in collaboration with others can do the work. Like that's where, that's where for us, the pivot has been significant, right? Mm -hmm. Because you need people right who have those lived experiences that they can bring authentically into the institution um but none of this is possible like i said if all aspects of the institution is not on board um it doesn't happen there's so many mm. ways in which a no or um you know if, if in, a, in the work that we did if the faculty association said no if the union said no it wouldn't it wasn't going to happen right um, if the board of governors said no, because they make all the financial decisions and hiring is a financial decision, if they said no, it wasn't going to happen. So being able to, um, to get everyone on board for the change is actually the only way in which you can make it happen. So uh, I guess a big difference and a big pivotal moment was appointing you as a dean. How did that happen? <laughs> um, I mean, the thing is, is that, that um, you know, like one of the things I'm, I makes me very happy is that that OCAD University was already on this trajectory. Um, so first of all, they made a call that saying they were looking for a dean who could not just do diversity and inclusion, but actually use the word decolonization. And again, I was wanting to move from Australia back to North America. And I applied for literally 11 jobs, I think that, that year. Um, and 
OCAD University was the only place that used the, the term decolonization. Um, then getting me because I had a lot of experience working with indigenous community in, um, in Australia, working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, then they, I had the experiences that whenever someone in the faculty said, oh, we can't do this. I was like, well, actually we did it. And this is what it looked like. And so I could bring exemplars into the institution so that again, I could give them a vision of what the change mm. could look like. Mm. Um, but, the, the, but my role really in all of this, because there was already a lot of momentum from students, there was already a lot of momentum for some, from, from faculty. My role was really just to remove the institutional barriers that was stopping that energy from being able to flow. Mm. And the great thing about being a dean at OCAD is that like the power seat at OCAD University is in the decanal team. <laughs> And so, so the decisions that we were able to make as deans are the ones that are actually truly able to transform the institution. And so having me there, me, it was very easy for me to remove those barriers that were stopping, again, the flow that was coming from the students and the faculty and the community itself. But you know, if, if that flow wasn't there, yeah, having yeah. me in that position would do nothing, right? Well, so you kind yeah. of have to. <laughs> there, there would have even been more conversations needed and more persuasion and, and, and more time. Um, uh, speaking about time, uh, there was a question about what advice do you have for uh, BIPOC designers who are frustrated by the slow pace of change within their organization? <laughs> uh, 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 read this book called Tempered Radical. <laughs> uh, it's, it's one of the... Um, so the, there's two things I normally say to this because I get this question a lot. Um, the first thing I say is that understand that in whatever domain of decision making that you have, you have impact, right? So if, if the only decision that you get to make in an institution is what image goes somewhere, you can make choices about that image that actually, you know, dismantles racism, dismantles oppression, dismantles, you know, discrimination, all those sort of things. So understand in where you have agency, you have the ability to push the institution forward within those sometimes very small decisions that you're making. The second thing that I say is then um, find allies um, because um, like I said, the work of this is the work of persuading others of change. And sometimes you're using your personal stories. Sometimes again, you're using examples from other institutions, but having those conversations to show people the vision of what is possible. And again, we're in design. So our job is to show people the visions of what is possible. So mm. using all of those skills and tools and mapping or whatever that you need to do to show people what is possible and that the outcomes of the, that changes will be positive in whatever metric that the institution uses to de define what is success for it. Um, having those conversations and getting more allies is how you begin to make the change happen. And it's frustrating, definitely. Like I said, do you read the book Temper Radical? Uh, because it was one of those things that saved my career. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at a time when I was more radical than temp tempered. Um, but what the book talks about is again, it's that all of these changes are relational. So you need to put your energy and your effort in building those relationships of allyship throughout the entire institution so that when the change is ready, it cascades really quickly through the institution. And that's been like, again, my experience at OCAD where Again, all of these influencers were working, having these conversations so that when, let's say I came in and I removed the blockages, it's cascaded really quickly. Like all of this has been done in a span of four years, right? Um, which again, when you look at the 144 years that preceded that, that was a really slow um, pace of change. But once you've built those relationships, it can cascade really quickly. 
Yeah, <clears throat> you have to put it in perspective, and you have to sort of celebrate the small wins and uh, and understand where you where where we are coming from. So, uh, but I can imagine that it's sometimes uh, frustrating. Um, it's always frustrating. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always frustrating. <laughs> change is all. Change always feels slow. Uh, yeah. So I'm in the Netherlands, and here's a question from somebody who. Um, uh, asked a question that I that is also really relevant for me, and I, the question is, how would you recommend to adapt and recontextualize this process for institutions outside of North America, or in Europe, for instance, where the context is different? Well, I, think, I would say yes, the context is different, but in a way that I sort of said, like with that, with that um, sort of mini exercise of thinking about what's your triangle. Um, like, again, I know enough about European history <laughs> to understand each place has its own triangle, right? Like I've spent time in Basque country, right? Which again, if you, if you think about it in the context of France and the context of Spain, like again, their positionality is like, they are the original indigenous peoples, right? Um, um, so I think even in Europe, you still have these kinds of relationships right you have relationships where groups of people were brought in to to do labor um that was free or or um or poorly compensated um you have communities that move from one place to another in order to build to settle right and build a better life um so i would say even in the context of europe um you have these relationships that have been established and so interrogating those positionalities is a way to begin to understand that history. Um, and again, you can tie, you can understand history to the materiality of design. Like all of these things are made manifest, these values, right, are made manifest through design and then people experience them. So in the context of that, looking to yourself, looking to your own history, looking to those positionalities, unpacking that through design um, is a good step to, um, again to lay the foundation for understanding that which you want and need to change um, about the institution in the future okay um i can imagine that uh it's hard for me to imagine uh the context in, uh, in north america or in australia uh, maybe it's more intense or the conversation there is uh, more vocal but uh like you said, the, the process might be uh, exactly the same. Um, I think we have time for one more uh, question. Let's see. Um, okay, let's take this one. So here's a question about the process. And um, people are curious, uh, how have you come up uh, with these um, six principles? Can you share how did you come up with the process? How was it developed? Um, yeah, I mean, this is in, the, the sixth principle is really just a sort of distillation and summary of what we actually did as an institution, right? Probably, and the six is laid out actually in some ways, probably chronological order mm -hmm. um, in many ways, right? So, um, so again, it's for me, it's just a distillation of the things that we've learned um, and why those things are. What are those aspects of the experiences that we have that we can share with others um, around how they might approach it? Um, so you know, again, I'm, I'm a design anthropologist, so I'm very good at mapping out processes. It's not, you know, I would say, like I said, in some ways, probably for most institutions, um, it's step, their step one might be step two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you kind of enter where you are in some ways as an institution, but really it's just a distillation of what our actual experience is. And we're preparing, there's a course that we're continuing studies course that we're, um, we're, we're launching at OCAD on um, November the 18th. Um, and it's, it, each module is actually based on each of their steps where we're providing like resources around what are the things that we were reading, a narrative around the experience of like, again, the experience of change in the institution. And then again, what are some of the, um, what are some of the exercises that people can do to kind of begin to move their institutions forward in, in like, again, how do you rewrite your job descriptions? Um, how do you 
create different personas for the kinds of people that you want to bring into the institution. So, so the well, process is laid yeah. out as a process to be shared. <laughs> Well, will it be shared or yeah will like it... is it we, we um some will get someone to sort of send out the link um so yeah so we're offering a continuing studies course uh called oh. hiring for diversity inclusion and decolonization in the creative industries um and so it opens up on um november the 18th it's online digital of course because this is of course <laughs> uh but there's a every it's kind of runs for three weeks so on every tuesday after assignment there's a one hour synchronous um session that you have with me to kind of go through the work that you've done in the institution so we'll, we'll send that up <laughs> awesome sounds great um there have there are many more questions, uh, <laughs> but we'll have to keep it at this. Dory, if you have time, feel free to browse through the Q and A and the chat. Um, uh, you sparked a lot of uh, comments and and uh, and thoughts here. Thank you for being the first keynote here in this virtual conference. Thank you for joining us, and uh, hopefully, we'll hear a lot more from you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>